going to present at maintaining a flat pack repository. So I'm Alex. I work at Red Hat. I've been doing known stuff for the last 20 years or so. The last, I think, maybe now four or so, I've been working on Flatpak and Flathub and all the ecosystems around that. Uh, and this is going to be a talk about how to maintain a Flatpak repository. One of the core parts of how Flatpak works is that it's distributed. Anyone or decentralized or like anyone can run their own uh, repository. This is not maybe what you always want. If you just want to publish your thing, it's much easier to just put it on Flathub or you know, if, if you eventually have an elementary store, you just put it there. But it's also possible that you might want to do your own thing for a CI system or, or for Endless or something. So this is about that. So it's going to be sort of technical. I mean, I guess I should first say what is Flatpak, but I assume most people here know what it is. It is for you to install apps. Did I do that right? Did I follow the rules? Um, anyway, it does all sorts of stuff, like sandboxing and portals and whatnot. But in, in this talk, we're just going to assume that apps are files that we ship from A to B, and to C and D and E. So we have one place where we want to ship to many places, to many users. <coughs> and, and this talk is going to be about how Flatpak stores files, how Flatpak transfers files. And it's going to be a lot of backing technical stuff, which is not necessarily super important to know all the details about. But having a feeling for how it works and how the repository looks helps a lot when you run it. So it's, it's going to be how it, how it works, but also how you as a sysadmin will like physically like type commands to make things happen. So the basic of everything Flatpak is OS3. OS3 is often de described as Git for operating system, which if you happen to know the details of the Git internals is a very good explanation. But most people don't actually know the G Git data model. So I'm going to talk to you through the details of how a repository actually works. So <coughs> typically, a repository is a storage of directors of files in something called branches. So we start with an app which is just a bunch of files, and they're regular files. And we make a repository using the OS3 repo init command, and then we commit it, and we give it a name. The name is called branch here. Uh, you don't t typically call things master in OS3. That's more of a git thing, but you could. And it will spit out this uh, identifier for the commit that is currently the one that is on the tip of the master branch. And you can use commands very similar to Git to get information about the branch. This here is uh, the object identifier for the commit. And if you look at the result of this, and if you ever looked into the .git directory in a git checkout, you will recognize this. It's very, very similar. Uh, everything starts in this directory called ref. Ref is actually also a Git name. In Git, a ref is kind of an abstraction of branches. Like a branch is a ref, but a tag is also a ref, and you know, a GitHub pull request is also a ref. So, but all the stuff in ref heads are the branches. And this is just a file that contains some text, which happens to be uh, the object identifier, which is just this. It's a checksum, so it's so it's a hex number. In reality, they're a lot longer, but that doesn't work well for slides. But if you look at that, you can then find this object of this type commit in the objects directory. And you can follow that. This thing is just a small file that has all the metadata about the commit. But it also has a pointer, or rather, the value of the root directory, which is this red thing. I kind of color them so you can follow them. Uh, as they move from the, the directory to the commit. So the commit will have the pointer to the root directory, and the root directory will have pointer to the stuff in it. And then like recursively, you can find anything by starting at this ref file. Uh, and the, the leaf nodes are the files. 
and they're actually just regular files. So you can go into the repository and you, they're just the same as the actual app. This is one place where Git and OS3 is different. In OS3, there are, or in Git, there are all these packers and all this complicated way of storing stuff. But for reasons we'll come to later, they're just files. And these names look really random, but actually there are checksums. Like for the, for the files themselves, it's basically just a checksum of the file itself. And then the same for these, it's just a checksum of the metadata. So th the interesting thing is here that the checksum of the commit contains the name of the root directory, which recursively contains everything. So the checksum of this top level thing is just basically a reference for the entire thing. And <clears throat> if you were to uh, commit the same thing again, like if you had if you had a real if you had a copy of this you got from somewhere else and you checked it in, you would end up with exactly the same thing here, because the checksums would be the same. Well, the commit has some like the timestamp and so something, but but all the other things would be exactly the same. <clears throat> so, if you modify this here, like we we change the thing and we commit again, or as it would be more common in Flatpak, you rebuild it and commit a, a new version, but most files are the same. You will end up with a, a, a new, a new uh, commit object and a bunch of new files. But since the uh, checksums are the same, most of these files are still the same in the, in the object directory. So the thing they changed is we got a new commit object that points to the parent, so there's a history here, plus it points to the new root, and the new root points to the new file, plus the old directory. Oh, the, all right, the bin directory here. So, <coughs> when you commit a new version of something, where not a lot of things changed, then n you'd only add the changed files, basically. So it's, very, it's a very efficient way to store things that changed, or even things that are unrelated, but happened to have the same files in it. Like it's likely that the two apps happen to have the same Python version, or at least similar versions, so a bunch of the Python libraries are the same, and they will just automatically be shared in this. The next thing is the reverse operation, the checkout. You have this, you got it from somewhere, doesn't really matter. You run the checkout command, we generate, we get back whatever we checked in, basically. Looks the same, but if you look in detail, it's actually slightly different. All these files happen to have a link count of two. Uh, that means there are hard links somewhere that points to them. And in fact, there are hard links back into the object store. This has two advantages. It's very cheap to do a checkout. We never write a lot of files. We use construct new inodes and new directories. We don't write all the data there. But also, it's very cheap in terms of disk. Like, we can do 50 checkouts of the same thing and it wouldn't use more space than the original repository. And if you check out two different things and they happen to share some files, those files will be automatically shared. And the sharing is happening on disk, but also in the Linux kernel because page cache sharing is done by inode. Like if you, if you have, happen to have the same glibc in like all your apps that's running, it's only gonna be cached once in the kernel. So automatic deduplication on disk and in the, in the cache. And based on this, we create a Flatpak installation. This is the typical system installation. There's also one for each user, where you can do like per user installs. But this is the default one. It has a repository, an OS3 repository. And in that, we have apps and runtimes stored as branches. This is very different from how Git will work. In Git, you typically have a checkout paired with a repository. So you have the .git, and then you have the uh, checkout, and you modify the checkout, what, what it currently points to. Whereas in OS3, you typically have one repository with many branches, and you check out the branches on the side. And there, so we have the repository, and all the stuff that are, are in there is also checked out. It's an operation we call deploy in a flat pack. And they're actually deployed, you can see here if you look at this, they're deployed 
in a directory by the name of the ref, but also by the name of the commit in there. So anytime you shake out a new one, this active symbolic still points to the old, meaning that this is the, the new one. And until you do a full checkout of everything and ensure that it's synchronized on disk and everything is fine, then you atomically switch the active thing. And at that point, the new version is the one that's running. And you know, by then, you can eventually remove the old one and what, what have you. And the files inside are just like, there's a bunch of metadata and there's a directory called files that just, just has the files. Like, it's just, it's a prefix basically that gets mounted into your app. But when you're distributing this, this local format is not what you want. So there's a different form of repository called archive repositories that are slightly different. It looks mostly the same. The red things are, are what's different. Uh, files are compressed because that's just smarter. But not only that, the files contain uh, the metadata that we would otherwise store on the file, so permission, ownership, timestamps, these sorts of things you cannot get from a web server. So we store them inside the file instead. Uh, oh. There's a uh, commit meta file that is contain extra information about the commit outside of it, mostly used for storing the GPG signature of the commit. GPG is used all over the place to verify that things are not tampered with in any way. On the server, we still have this refs directory, but directories are not great for web servers. Like, there's no standard way to enumerate them or anything. So there's this additional thing called a summary file that we regenerate every time we modify the repository, basically by trolling this refs directory and making it one big file. Uh, so the summary file has a list of all the refs and their current values. And it's very useful both as a replacement for, for trying to enumerate the directory over HTTP, but it's also an, a single file that you can get atomically, and it, it represents the entire state of the, of the repository at that point in time. So it's like a, any, any, any changes that happen after this in the repository, you can ignore, like you have a, a snapshot of this point where you can get all the refs at the same time. And as long as you never delete old object files in your repository, you can forever know exactly all the things that were at this point. Although the file tends to be large, we have like a local cache of it, kind of like the apt or jump metadata. Like whenever we do an operation, we start by getting the latest summary and then we work from that locally. It also has space for random metadata that Flatpak uses to encode certain stuff from all the apps, such as permissions, dependencies, so that we can, for example, ask whether you want to accept these permissions before you install the app. And we can download the right runtime, it depends on before we install the app. But these are just extracted from the apps themselves and stored in the summary file. So the basic way you would then install an app is you'd look at the summary file, find the object, the commit, recursively spy through all the obvious files that you don't already have locally available. And most of the time, you would eventually reach a directory that was already existing in the previous version, and then we just you know, prune that entire directory and skip it. And then we download all this into a temporary directory, and when everything is Verify. We have to verify that the, uh, each individual object actually checksums to the name it has. And then at the end, we can just uh, take the GPG signature of the top level thing, which is the commit object. And if that's valid, then the entire thing is valid. There's also a feature called static deltas, where we can have pre-generated binary diffs between uh, versions of an app. So it's a useful optimization. The, the generic O3 pull operation does skip downloading things that are the same, but if, if, like, if just a single byte changed of some file, it would still download the entire new file. So there, this is a way to do a more, more optimized, like, 
yes, yeah, basing an xdef of the files, and we are we can only use it if we know we have all the data in the previous version, because then we can use the old data uh, to apply the diff. Uh, there's also a way to do a diff from nothing, which is useful because then we create like a single large file, which is useful for for minimizing the number of run chips. If you download large things like some like a runtime has a lot of small files, and it's more efficient to do it once. But these are all optional, and it's up to you as a, like an admin of a of a, um, a repo to decide how many how many deltas you want to keep around. You know, there's a cost of generating them, there's a cost of storing them, versus you know the gains you have from them. Uh, we also have something called AppStream branches. I don't know if most people know what AppStream is, but it's like a metadata format for describing apps. Um, descriptions, versions, screenshots, all that kind of stuff. And each app has one. And then while we're updating the repository, we extract all of them from all the apps and put them into one super like XML file. So, so each individual one is called an app data. And then we combine them into what's called an app stream, which is uh, XML for all the things. And also the icons and whatnot. And this is what uh, app stores use for, for showing information, like the, the web app uses this, KD Discover, GNOME Software uses this. And it's actually already used by most things because it's also used for packages like DAB and uh, RPMs. So it's nothing new, but it's important to be aware that we have to regenerate this branch whenever something changes. So in practice then, how would you do maintenance of such, such a system? First of all, you have to have some kind of master repository. So there's one machine somewhere that has the master copy of the repository. And then you ship to users from that. It's not a great idea to ship that directly to users, because that machine should not be loaded by, a, by random users load. So the, either you sync the contents to your system where you deploy things. Maybe it's a different machine. Maybe it's some. Amazon S3, or maybe actually most common is to just put up caching uh, web servers in front of it, like a proxy, Nginx proxy or something. So that, that makes it very easy to use, distribute it to people. Um, some things you have to be careful about here is if you do some kind of synchronization, this, the summary file refers to all the objects in the repo, so you have to make sure you copy all the objects like move all the new object in place before you replace the summary file. Otherwise, some client might be pulling something, expecting all the objects to be there, but they're not. Uh, you also have to be careful about synchronizing the signatures, in particular the summary signature. It's a separate file. So if, if, they're, if they're not in sync, you will get a G GPG warning. And generally, like if you copy those two files at the same time, that's really a very, very marginal risk for races. But if by accident you happen to cache for a long time different version of them, then you run into really bad issues. Also, you shouldn't be building your stuff on this master machine. I mean, it's just bad form, but also it's, you probably want to build on multiple architectures so it's not possible. Instead, you build on some kind of build machines you have set up. And then you use this other command called build commit from, which is, is a way to import builds into a repository. So it's not a, uh, it's not a commit operation, because you already have a commit. But it's also not a pull, where we just move the commit into a, the repository. Instead, it recreates a new commit that like takes information from both sides. So we have the old parent from the, from the master repository but the data from the new commit. So we have things like uh, the like the actual file come from the new commit, but uh, the GPG signature, maybe the timestamp, maybe the comment, you can add that at the point where you import it. Uh, and you generally do that then multiple times, one like one for each build. Or maybe you want to bunch imports in general to avoid churning the summary files a lot. 
And then when you're done, you run this build update repo thing, which will uh, regenerate upstream data, regenerate the summary, and uh, it can also it generates deltas or remove all deltas, things like that. And <clears throat> in these commands, anything actually that changes the summary file or creates a new commit object, you have to specify a GPT signature that that's your that you want to use for that poster. Otherwise, you will accidentally end up with an unsigned thing, and your users will get complaints from Flatpak about GPG not matching and whatnot. And in general, there are some rules about GPG keys. You shouldn't use your own. Like, a lot of people have personal GPG keys. Don't use those. Generate new ones for each repository. That way you can like hand it over to someone else or have different level of security. Like, ideally, the private key should never, ever get off the, the master repo. And, and in Flatpak, we even have like a hardware dongle. So the private key never leaves this USB stick thing. It's pretty cheap these days to get one of those. Uh, and, and we do have a way to uh, migrate to a new GPG key. It's not perfect, but basically we can load the new GPG key and then as clients update, they get the new one and eventually you, you just move over and assume like it, you left it there long enough for everyone to have the new one. To really do well worldwide, you really want to use a CDN or something like that. And uh, the way the OS2 repo works is very, it matches very well how a CDN works because all, all the files are static. You can just cache them forever. The only thing you have to be uh, careful with is the summary file. Uh, so the setup on Flatop is that we have some Nginx proxies that, that host. Uh, that, that proxies the main uh, repository, and then everything is cached in fastly from that. And, and we, whenever we update the summary file, we have this, fastly has this REST API where we can trigger purging of certain things from the cache. So we, we cache the summary files, but then we purge it automatically whenever it needs to. That was about how you manually do things. But probably you want to use this other thing I wrote called Flat Manager, which does all this for you. Uh, so, so it's written in Rust. So it's basically a shared or a statically linked thing. You can use drop in place and run. It does use Postgres, so you have to have a Postgres, some some kind of Postgres install and like a small JSON config file that defines things. So it it, it does like serve the repository. You can install directly from there, but what you typically do is stand up some kind of Nginx in front of it for load balancing and, and ideally also CDN or something. But it also has the REST API that lets you add stuff to, uh, to the repository. So there, there's a token-based system where you can generate tokens that have permissions to upload. You know, they, can, they can be subsets, you can only you can hand out permissions to only upload in your namespace or only uh, modify a certain build or whatnot. Uh, and, and if you use these, you can create like test builds. So it maintains a set of test builds and you can upload to the test builds. And when everything is uploaded, you uh, trigger basically a commit of the test build and then it will run the updates and create a summary file. So you, basically end up with this mini repository with just your app that you can like try to install from and verify that the app builds and whatnot. And if every, everything looks good, then you can do a publish of that, which imports it into the actual uh, master repository. And that triggers all this like stuff we have to do, like updating the summary file, generating app stream, deltas, and this is actually a bit more flexible, like you can have work machines to generate deltas, and there's a more, more expressive way to declare which deltas you want to generate. And we can hook into various places, like uh, there's a call out when, whenever the summary changes that you can easily add some curl code, curl call or something to trigger a CDN invalidation or something. It ge does generate Flatback ref files for all new builds. 
it mirrors screenshots for, from the uh, app stream data, so you can have your own copy of that, and a bunch of other stuff. And there's a REST API. It's not complicated. You can implement it yourself, but there's also it comes with a Python client that you can use to just, if you just want to upload your builds from your build machines. It's actually pretty cool the way the, so you, you create a, like a build, which creates a new URL, and then you can push to this. So you build, build a repository on your machine, and you push it. But uh, the way we use it on FlatHub is that uh, the master system creates the build, and then all the build machines does the pushing. So we never have to copy anything to the master machine. It copies directly into the repository. But each build machine gets a token that only allows it to upload to this particular build. So like the, the build machines are separated from everything else. And then at the end, every build machine reported that, that it's correct. And then we can commit it. And then we create like a pull request comment. Here's a link to the, to the repository. You can try this thing out. And when it's done, you just click on something in the UI, and it publishes it. Uh, I think that's, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about this too. This is more of recent work. Uh, there's a bit, been a lot of talk about you know, buying stuff and monetiz monetizing stuff. And I've been working on the, the, very, the very fundamental part of buying stuff, which is allowing you to not download stuff, basically. So th there is this setup where the repository requires an HTTP bearer token for certain refs. And the way the repository works, it's complicated to know what sort of stuff ends up in what app, because due to the sharing, like any random object could be in any random uh, app. But there are some objects that you always have to download and you never, never use for anything else, which is the commit object itself and the Delta Superblock, which are two small files with you know, specific uh, path names that we can easily filter those and only require a token for them. So what would ha then happen is on your machine, your local client, you have something called a, an authenticator configured for the remote. And whenever uh, Flatpak knows that you need to buy this thing, it will ask the configured uh, authenticator for that remote for a token. And then it would use that token when it does all the HTTP requests for the refs. So this is very generic, and the authenticator could be whatever. And it could be doing, uh, it could be showing you a, like a user interface using GTK or whatever. It could be doing web calls. It could be using pre-existing uh, things like the rel uh, entitlement system has like a local key that you can use to sign things or whatever. I don't know exactly how it works, but we can hook into whatever system you already have, or we can create new ones. So it's a, it's a very generic system. Uh, and But yeah, typically it's paired with some sort of pre-existing system that records purchases, be it, be it the rel system or some kind of web server that handles like purchases of flat hub or something. And, and the way we know that something requires purchases is that we have added this metadata called the token type. And if the token type is unset or if it's zero, then we don't have to do anything special. We can just do it as before. So we can mix like free download and purchase stuff in the same repository. But if it's set, we pass it to the uh, uh, Authenticator to do whatever it wants with. It's it's possible that that we set the token type for something, and then ask the uh, authenticator, and it decided you don't actually need a token because maybe we can do a client side donation thing. So it's not actually protected on the server, but we can still round trip on our local thing, so we can ask for donations or something. But it's also possible that it does a web call or doing something. And the authenticator can also use uh, web callbacks that, so we have a callback system in the, in the, in the Flatpak library, so apps like GNOME Software or, or 
Kitty Discover can allow the, um, the authenticator to show web flows, which are somewhat integrated with the UI. I mean, they're web stuff, so it's also not native, but still like controlled by the app. So the, the window and whatnot that we store, that we show the web stuff is, is controlled by the client at least. Uh, this is all work in progress, but I hope to land it in the next version just like end of the year something and then we can use that to eventually do something for flat hub and yeah i guess no questions then